I'm Walter Cronkite. In this three-part series, we will look at the people, boats, and races which have made maritime history and show the extraordinary lengths to which sailors have gone in their effort to sail to win. For a number of years, I've been associated with Mystic Seaport and its work to preserve our maritime history. In our first episode, we look at a fascinating piece of that collection in a film on a class of boats called the New York 30s and the restoration of one boat, the Ibis. This outstanding sailboat was built almost 90 years ago and designed by Nathaniel Harrisoff, a leader and innovator in all areas of maritime design. In all, 18 of the New York 30s were built in those early days of the 20th century. And now, with the support of Mystic Seaport Film and Video Archives, we present authentic New York 30s. It looks like the most prettiest boat I've ever seen. I said, someday I'm going to own this boat. You take a 16-year-old kid who's supporting his mother, where the hell does he get the nerve to say, I'm going to own the boat? But I'm a very religious man. He was stripped, wrecked, sunk. OK, now he's the main. He's the main. And 12 years or 14 years later, I owned the boat, even though I didn't know it was the same boat when I bought it. Come on, Ibis. Sweet, lovable bitch. The year 1904, and America had grand plans. The workday started at 7 in the morning and ran to 5 in the evening. Income tax was 11 years away. Teddy Roosevelt was the president, and digging began on the Panama Canal. At home, yachting was in its heyday. As the largest cup defender ever, the Reliance had just defeated the British challenger, Shamrock III. But there was unrest at the New York Yacht Club. The young members wanted a light, one-design boat for their own racing pleasure. Small days sailors of about 43 feet overall length, not less than 30 feet at the waterline. A committee was formed and chose a design submitted by the man who had built the Reliance, the brilliant Nathaniel Harrison. Captain Nat and his blind brother, J.B., ran the world's finest boat shop in Bristol, Rhode Island. Well, uh, the Harrisoffs built every cup defender, eight in a row, from 1893 to 1934. And uh, my grandfather, Captain Nat, actually sailed on um, all six of his cu own cup defenses, that is, of the boats that he designed, going from the Vigilant in 1893 through the um, Resolute in 1920. So he's probably sailed in more America's Cup races than anybody else. On November 5, 1904, the Harrisoffs signed a contract to build eight boats based upon sketches. The final design existed only in Captain Nat's head. My grandfather had a most unusual way to design the uh, boats. Like anybody else, he would start with a conception and a basic design. But the thing that he did differently was that in designing the hull, instead of making a series of uh, one-dimensional views, which combined to a three-dimensional shape, he immediately uh, constructed a half model. He carved it out of uh, white pine wood. And it was the carving of this model that established the exact shape of the model, translated the ideas he had in his mind into something real. And then measurements were made from the model, and that became the shape of the boat. On the morning of January 4, 1905, a prototype was launched, and Captain Nat wrote the New York Yacht Club. By the time we got underway, there wasn't a ripple on the water, and ice had formed. But the boat moved off nicely. They should prove good sailors in light air. The testing ended abruptly when Captain Nat got a crick in his neck and went home to bed with lumbago. The Harrisoffs set up a carefully planned assembly line to build what had now become a run of 18 boats. The 30s were built side by side at a rate of one a week. 
They were planked upside down with cypress inside and yellow pine set in shellac outside. Each piece was prefabricated. The price $4,000 paid in three installments included were racing sales, bedding, a stove full, cooking utensils, china in racks, an egg beater, two lemon squeezers, and a can opener. They were built not necessarily to last these 80 years, but they were built very lightly to sail fast and win races. And I think the fact that they've last is a tribute not only to the design, but to the good um, uh, woods and other materials that went into them, and to the good workmanship, and also to the owners, the, the owners who preserved them. Well, the way they were built, the most perfect. Look at these, look at these bungs. Look at the bungs on this boat. How would anybody do that now? Smooth as glass. Every single thing was perfect. See that? And the workmen, perfect. Nothing was ever turned out that wasn't good. Nothing. He did honest work. And that's the secret of it. Well, when my father joined my uncle, uh, and, uh, it was said that he, that it was agreed that they would not compete with other builders, but would excel so that in other words, they were in a class by themselves. He was an artist. Uh, the manufacturing he left to his superintendents and to his, well, his brother while he was alive. And his interest was on designing something like this boat here, <clears throat> what he could do and get speed out of it. And the different woods that he would use, he was familiar with, and techniques. And he put it together, and a lot of it is artistry. Within three months, all 18 were completed, and members drew lots just to keep things on the up and up. The first race was held on May 27th, with Nautilus, number 16, winning. Racing rules limited prize money to $4 for first place, three for second, and two for third. Caramia took the 1905 season's championship with Ibis finishing seventh. And for the next two decades, the elegant Gaff Rig 30s continue to be the racing class in New York Yacht Club events. I understand that the uh, 30 feet of the waterline was chosen because that, there's an old rumor that that was what uh, the, the smallest boat you could own and still be a, a member. Well, that's probably about right. We have a boat in the collection of the Harrisoft Marine Museum that's even a little bit bigger than that, which is named Trivia. And she was given to Harold Vanderbilt when he graduated from high school. And I think the name Trivia was because this yacht of only some 48 feet was considered very small and almost trivial. So what you say is true. As the years went by, other one design classes sprung up, only to fall from fashion. But the 30s kept going strong. And while the feverish racing competition may have waned a bit, the boats did continue to provide their owners with many a good cruise. If these early home movies taken aboard number 15, the Banzai, are any indication. the 30s met with such good fortune. Retired sanitation worker Willie Wolf tells where he discovered one. First time I saw the Ibis, she was laying in the mud flats behind Hunter's Island. I used to do service calls in New Rochelle, and I'd seen it on the shore road three or four times. A friend of mine, Dick Rath, and I discussed it. We went up there one night, put a rowboat in the water and rowed out to it, got the registration numbers off of it. We found out who owned the boat, we went ahead, contacted the person, and after a bottle of whiskey was devoured, we bought the boat for $100. As luck would have it, the boat turned out to be the very same New York 30 Willie had dreamed of owning as a boy. The remarkable thing about it is, when I bought the boat in 1957, I didn't even know it was the same boat. The name was changed, there was no rig on it, everything was painted battleship gray and white, 
So I do believe in God, because he answered a prayer right then and there. She was built for C. O'Donnell Disland in 1905, originally. Uh, the 1907-1908, she was transferred to J.P. Morgan, Jr. And J.P. Morgan had it till I believe, 1913. Then somewhere in the 20s, a fellow by the name of Maxwell owned it. This was after they removed the first keel on it for the war effort, the First World War. Uh, later on, uh, John Dillette owned the boat, put it on a freighter, shipped it down to Puerto Rico, and he sailed it back home. 1953, I pick up the boat again. She was owned by uh, Morton Engel. And Morton Engel was racing the boat fairly extensively. And in 53, there was Hurricane Carol. She broke her moorings and sunk 90 foot of water in hen and chickens. Uh, they raised the boat. Jack Pomeroy bought the boat. He stripped the mainmast out of it, stripped the keel off of it, and left the laying in Jake's boat yard up in Mamaroneck. A fellow by the name of John Corfeld, a college student, bought the boat from Jake for $300. Jake says, look, you got two weeks to get the boat in the water. Get it out of here. The kid brought it down to the New York Yacht Club. They took one look at it, and they says, we don't want that junk here. So he took it out and anchored it just over and behind Hunter's Island. That's where I seen it with the grass. And then one year after the other, we refastened it put in some more frames, and kept working on the boat. But financially, it becomes strapping to me, and I just couldn't keep up with it anymore. So I donated to Full Sea. In 1981, the Ibis passed into the hands of its 12th owner, the Full Sea Marine Preservation Organization, a volunteer program founded by Brooklyn College professor of comparative literature, David Karamidjian. Well, we started it um, for a very simple reason, that there were a few boats that we thought ought to be restored, and that we're going to go to hell if somebody didn't take them in uh, under tow. Uh, and we thought originally that we would uh, keep it very small. We would take two or three boats and restore them and develop some kind of an educational program to go along with it, not only a sailing program, but also uh, an environmental program. However, grand plans take money, and raising that money isn't easy, as David soon discovered. David Kiramijan. Did I speak with you about an hour ago? Yeah, I'm sure she... That's, that's fine. All right, thanks very much. All right, bye-bye. Voila, he's in a meeting. It took two years before David could find a company that shared his commitment to tradition, but raising money turned out to be only the beginning of the struggle. The organization itself, although it's been, it's a sort of a paradox. The organization has been the vehicle for getting a lot of boats into, in, back into the water and sailing and so forth. But it's also something that requires a tremendous amount of time and concentration and what have you. So the good old days when I used to own a boat personally, you know, and I could, I could focus on one boat and do it from A to Z, you know, rather orderly fashion. That doesn't seem to be happening here. Because there's organizational problems and, you know, all sorts of things that you have to attend to. You know, people are interested in getting out on what's available and doing some sailing, which is fine. And the, uh, you know, questions about history and the tradition of things and how we got where we are and what the meaning of the tradition is and how the tradition might be staying alive is not of a hell of a lot of importance to many people. Before putting the IBUS back in the water, naval architect George Stidell was brought in to take a look. George knows a thing or two about the boats. He was born the same year they were built, 1905. Old Harrishoff boats are less prone to rot than any boat that's ever been built, for one reason. They're well ventilated. For instance, they have no header here to, to uh, uh, cat trap water. They only have a clamp, no shelf and clamp. The shelf would stick inboard from the, what you see there, which is the clamp. He's need now to get back a little, the, the strength of a boat is in its four and a half members. That's what makes them hog, that's what makes them twist. 
No, you don't need heavy frames. He never put heavy frames in. He did diagonally strap them, but he had knees to tie in the deck. Those are natural knees, growed knees, as they call them. Right. <laughs> and uh, I really, I've never, in all my years, uh, I've never seen a truly rotted Herschel boat. As far as uh, workmanship like this, forget it. Uh, you'd have to go to heaven and bring them all back. The last of the good boat builders was in, in the early 30s, and they're all dead and gone. Every man I had, including my partner, is dead. Yeah. Uh, so where are you going to learn this stuff? They have little boat shops around. They're reading from uh, books and then trying to be boat builders. And it's just uh, not, it's nobody's fault. It's just the, uh, uh, in Europe, the boat builders have gone along. There are still boat builders, and there are apprentices. But here, everybody wants to stripe pants, you know, and uh, a <laughs> desk job. Well, there's some of that coming back, though, you know. There's yeah, but a it's lot too of late. You know, I like the elm trees. They're gone. Where are you going to get new ones? And uh, first of all, there's no lumber. Uh, go out and try to find uh, caulking irons, bent irons, and, and corner irons, and things like that, dumb irons, making irons. It's not easy. OK, when you get them, who's going to use them? Who can splice? Mm -hmm. they, they splice with a match. And this, this is it's quick and easy now. They, they turn the Tupperware <laughs> machine, and out comes a boat. Do you want it 10 feet long, or do you want it 40 feet long? George pronounced the Iba structurally sound, but urged full sea to get her back in the water as soon as possible. Good luck, Dave. Good luck. I know how you feel. Good how you feel. She's getting the slings all there. <laughs> well, the, if I want the aft strap as far forward as possible, the idea is to pick the, pick the lead up right there. Yeah. Even though everyone in the yard went out of their way to help the Ibis, today's modern world has rules, regulations, and schedules that aren't geared for an 80-year-old wooden boat. She cannot be hurried. She needs time to be carefully placed in the water, time for her wood to swell, and the clock is working against her. Brilliant. Brilliant. What happens at 4.30? At 4.30? <laughs> we quit. Unless he wants to pay time and a half, which I don't know. I know he doesn't want to. Anything after eight hours is overtime. Today, today, yes. Despite the difficult schedule, the decision is made to go ahead and put the ibis in the water and hope the extra pumps can keep up. This is something coming. What's the problem with the line? David just didn't bring any down. David's coming down now. We have enough water to float here, don't we now? Yeah, yeah. Super. We've done it. <laughs> there it is. With the ibis now in the water and her wood beginning to swell, work goes on back at the full sea shop. has to be reconstructed from scratch, following Harrisoff's original drawings and using mahogany. Even with the benefit of power tools, the project takes nearly six weeks. If Captain Nat made a mistake in designing the 30s, it was in building them with a bowsprit of only one foot three inches in length. The helmsman used to complain they were tough to handle on a close reach. But the problem was quickly remedied by increasing the length to three feet, three inches. The job of cutting the sails is given to Al Larson, a man whose ideas of work seem a little out of place today. One word, quality. Quality of workmanship and quality of materials. And 
nowadays everything nowadays everything is uh, mass produced. Uh, they can afford to have maybe 10% of uh, any product they manufacture as being uh, no good. Where well, in the old days there wasn't that volume of materials being made and each one had to be perfect. Otherwise, the fellow didn't stay in business. This takes about 20 minutes to wake a hole like this around. And then, then after we get all that done, we rope the old, the rope all by hand, every strand. And that takes a long time. Every strand you go through, and like that. That's the quality way. That's the way all sales are made. Uh, if uh, some of the old timers could get out of the grave now and look at the way sales are made nowadays, uh, I think they'd jump right back in the grave again. But this is, the, this is the quality way. This is the way New York 30s were built in wood. This is the way sales were made hand, hand work. That's the best way to do it. hasn't sailed in five years. Tomorrow she faces competition once again. A reunion with two other 30s at the Siwanaka Yacht Club, the site of many a race back in 1905. of age after being stripped, scrapped, sunk, and salvaged, the Ibis, New York 30 number two proudly sails again with two other originals, Anemone 2, number 18, now named Aquila, and Caramia, now fitted with a modern Marconi rig. And sail she does. For the Ibis is more than some old museum piece dusted off and brought out for a day of fresh air. She's a competitor with a strong breeze and her original powerful gaff rig. The Ibis can still sail with the best of today's high-tech boats. The cost to build a New York 30 like the Ibis from scratch today, if you could find the materials, $270,000. Take a 16-year-old kid who's supporting his mother. Where the hell does he get the nerve to say, I'm going to own the boat, and I'm a very religious man? Well, the way they were built, most perfect. Look at these bungs. Look at the bungs on this boat. How would anybody do that now? Well, they're like the elm trees. They're gone. Where are you going to get new ones? One word, quality. Quality of workmanship and quality of materials. That's the way it should be. We've done it. There it is. What is remarkable about the New York 30 class is the fact that of the 18 built, a number of them are still sailing and winning races today. In almost any wind or sea condition, the New York 30s show the assets of good design and thoughtful construction. It's an inspiration to see how these great boats, nearing 100 years old, are still sailing today, providing recreational fun for their owners and a moment of the past for the viewer. 